Part 1. You will hear a man telephoning an employment agency to register for job opportunities. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. Able Employment, how may I help you? I saw your advertisement in the Daily Gazette. Oh, yes. And I'd like to register with you. I'm a student, but I've got the long holiday coming up. Certainly. I'll just get the form ready. OK, let me take your details. Sure. Can I have your full name? It's Bowen. James Bowen. B-O-W-E-N. Right. And your address, please? Well, just now I'm staying at the youth hostel. I see. But I'm moving into a flat on Friday. Well, give me that one, then. It's 4 Lion, like the animal, Road, Melford, MF4 5JB. OK. And then I need to have a phone number for you. Uh, I don't know the number at the flat yet, but I could give you my mobile. That's 0 721 Eight double two. Would that do? For the time being. But if you can let me know your new number when you can. Of course. Now, qualifications. What qualifications have you got? I mean, post-16 qualifications. Well, I stayed on at school till 18 and got my A-levels. Fine. Anything else? You said you were a student. Yes, and then I've done two years at college, so I've got my history diploma though I don't know how useful that'll be for getting a job. Well, it depends. Everything counts in some way. And I also did an IT course this year, and that got me my computer skills certificate, which I certainly hope is relevant. It's different anyway. Um, that's all, really. Hmm, that's quite a good range. And what about on the practical side? What work experience have you got? Well, not too much, because I've mainly been studying. Yes. But two summers ago, I worked just as general assistant in a hospital for about three months. It was quite hard, but very interesting. OK. Anything else? If you include part-time work... Oh, yes. I've often worked in the college holidays as a tour guide, showing visitors round. That's quite enjoyable, meeting people. I'm sure. Hmm. Now on to interests... There's space here for two. What would you say? Two? Uh, well, I like various sports, but I suppose we should put that I'm in the swimming club. I'm pretty committed to that. Yes, that sounds good. And for the other one, something different? I'm very keen on music, too, and I love playing piano. I've been doing that for over ten years now. Yes, I'll put that down. Well, that's more or less it for the time being. Uh-huh. Just one more thing. What I do need is your availability. Oh, yes. Um, the college term finishes on June the 20th, and then I'm going to visit my parents. But I can be back and ready to start on June the 28th, if that seems OK. I'm sure it is. Now, what happens next is that I process this information, and then... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the organiser of a group holiday talking to the group before they arrive at their destination. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16.
Thank you, everybody, for your attention. I hope you're all looking forward to arriving at the town. I thought you might like to know a few things while we're still on the coach, and it'll help to pass the time on our journey. OK, a y as you know, we're staying at the Park Hotel. It's comfortable and friendly. We're booked in for three nights. Now, I'm aware that not everyone wants breakfast there, so if you do want it, you should tell the hotel that you do the night before. We're making our own arrangements for dinner each evening, and there's a cafe open at the hotel most of the time if you want a drink or a snack. There's also a very pleasant lounge on the ground floor with a collection of fascinating paintings. And then I hope you're going to enjoy the various activities that are lined up. However, I do have to tell you that there have been some changes since the original programme. For one, because it's been restored and is therefore closed to the public, we won't be going to the castle after all, I'm afraid. However, there's plenty else to see, and the gardens are still open. Something we've been able to add to the programme is for Saturday, when a local historian will give us a lecture on famous people from the town. I don't know who that includes yet. So, to free up the time for that, we've made another little amendment and changed the trip to the antique show that was due for then on to Sunday. Actually, I think that'll make for a more relaxed programme anyway. We're leaving the rest of Sunday free for you to wander around as you wish. One place you might like to try is the art gallery, because it's got a huge display of old postcards. You can't really send them home to your family and friends, but it's interesting and sometimes funny to see what people used to send. Well, um, that's the lot on changes. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. I thought it could be useful to try and get your bearings now before we actually arrive, so I'll give you a few pointers on your maps. OK, a y um, first things first, the Park Hotel, because I assume you'll want to deposit your luggage before anything else, w e l l be driving into the town from the west and stopping at the bus station. To get to the hotel, just go straight down the high street towards the railway bridge, and after the bridge, if you go left... You'll soon see it on the right. As I say, it's a nice place. You can check in, see your rooms, relax a little. There are a couple of interesting little shops nearby. There aren't any internet facilities at the hotel, I'm afraid, so if you want to send any emails, you'll need to get yourselves to the internet cafe. In fact, if you want to do that first, it's easy because it's near the bus station, on the corner towards the right of Curtis Lane and Kramer Street. So, once you've done that, well, if you do that, then I suppose you'll be ready to do a bit of exploring. You've got your basic maps, but you may want to get more information, and the Tourist Information Office is the place to do that. It's up around the train station area. From the bus station, you could go up any of the streets to the left, c a d o g a n Road, Earl Street or Duke Street. The office is directly facing the train station, on the corner with Earl Street. They've got all sorts of brochures and leaflets about local attractions and tickets for sale. They even sell some locally produced jams and chocolates. And a last pointer at this stage is our venue for dinner tonight, the Royal House Restaurant. This is conveniently located in the very centre of town. In fact, you'll no doubt pass it as you're walking around beforehand. In relation to the bus station, It's not far. Going down the High Street, if you pass the corner with Cromwell Road, then the next junction is a crossroads with Duke Street and Runton Road, and it's there. You'll be able to see its rather grand entrance over on the left corner. The food and the service there are both excellent, so it promises to be an enjoyable evening. Well, uh, we're just coming into the town now, so... If you... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a man talking about living and working on Trinidad. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Hi, I'm Steve Pinfold, and I'm here today to tell you about my gap year, which I took about 20 years ago. Unlike many students these days who go travelling or get some work experience between school and university, I decided to do something completely different after finishing my degree. I applied to work for a charity organisation. What it does is it sends people with particular skills to countries where those skills are needed. Apart from having some experience teaching English to summer school students, I didn't have any particularly useful skills, I thought, but luckily I was still accepted. I had to find the money for the flight, but you get free accommodation. I stayed with a family of five. And you do get paid, but not much. It's a bit like pocket money, enough to get by. I worked in an orphanage and taught English at a local school. Where was I? Well, originally, I was going to be sent to a village in India, but at the last minute, the organisation decided to send me to Trinidad. Now, this is a fascinating place. It's an island in the Caribbean. Well, in fact, the country is actually two islands. The smaller one is called Tobago, which is connected somehow to the word tobacco. Anyway, there I was, a young white guy living and working on an island which is mostly a mixture of descendants from Africa and India. The Africans were originally brought over as slaves, and the Indians came later as indentured workers. That means they agreed to come for a specific time, but many of them stayed. There are also some Trinidadians of Chinese and British origin, though the native inhabitants were basically wiped out by colonialization. I myself felt completely accepted and had the time of my life. The language everyone speaks is English, so there was no problem for me there, but some concepts don't quite translate. They're pure Trinidadian. There's the term liming, for example, which means sitting around watching the world go by. Also, there's the famous carnival when the whole island is taken up in playing mass. For a whole month around February or March, it depends when Easter is, everyone's busy preparing costumes, practicing calypsos, soca and steel pan music, and most importantly, partying. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. When the actual official carnival starts, it's days of 24-hour dancing in the streets. In Trinidad, it's called whining. You've probably seen this sort of thing on TV, in the more famous carnival in Rio, or even at the Notting Hill Carnival in London. Many people join bands, each one of which has a theme. For example, the sea or jungle fever and they have costumes designed and made to go with the theme. These can cost a thousand dollars for the king and queen of each band. They're incredible. The whole city is a non-stop party zone, full of colour and sound. It's serious, too. 
The bands are in competition, and the winner gets a million dollars. Sorry, I got a bit carried away with those memories. Back to my real job there. The orphanage was called St. Augustine's, and that's also the name of the place where it was, St. Augustine, a town just outside the capital city, Port of Spain. I didn't have any particular job description, just to be with the children and tell stories, sing songs and play games. Oh, and we also went camping in the jungle once. I could tell you a few stories about that particular escapade. Every time I arrived at the gate, kids would come running towards me, shouting, with big smiles on their faces. The younger children seemed fascinated by my blonde hair and loved to touch it as if it was something miraculous. The English teaching I did two days a week in a primary school for six to eleven-year-olds. The kids may have been poor, but they all wore neat and clean uniforms and were so respectful and enthusiastic. I've now been teaching for many years in different countries, and I still think those were the best students I've ever taught. What else did I do while I was there? I swam a lot. Can you imagine what it's like swimming with dolphins and with pelicans diving into the sea right next to you? More seriously, I trained to be a Samaritan. That's someone who listens and supports people who have problems with their lives. Overall, what I took from the experience was a sense of being in another culture, or rather cultures. As humans, we all share many characteristics, but we express ourselves in various ways. In Trinidad, there are lots of different communities and religions, and so many different kinds of festival to see: Hindu, Muslim, Christian, as well as some rather mysterious African traditions. There are quite a few Rastafarians too. Trinidad is, as Americans are fond of saying of their own country, a melting pot. Where everybody is greeted warmly. Go and see for yourself. I'm not sure how it's changed since I was there, but I'd love to find out. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a writer giving a talk about the different kinds of writing that the audience might want to try doing. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. So I'm now going to say a few words about the various different kinds of writing you may want to consider. Each has its own challenges and rewards, and it's really a question of seeing what suits you best. There are no rights and wrongs here. Let's start by considering the short story. Remember that a short story isn't just a very concise novel. There are three basic styles: the story itself. The slice of life section, and the surprise type, and all of them are equally valid as treatments of the genre. When producing a short story, you don't have time for a slow build-up of interest, so you need to get in there straight away and begin with a crisis. Then there's non-fiction, which can sell very well, with biographies in particular frequently hitting the bestseller lists. It's important, however, to be sure your chosen topic is genuinely interesting to people, and you know enough about it to do it justice. So, when you're submitting your idea to a publisher, 
It's worthwhile to give them details of specialist knowledge you have. What about articles? Now, this is a very wide area, of course, going from the very learned and obscure to the populist gossip type. Articles based on giving advice are a proven area, and to give them a sufficient focus, you should produce your article for a definite market. That will help to define your purpose. Turning to something different, there's the question of poetry. It's often hard to define what poetry is exactly. Maybe it's easier to say what it isn't, but it should be subtle. So the message of a poem oughtn't to be overly obvious. True poems let the ideas sit there for the reader to ponder. What they must do is sound good, like singing. So. I recommend reading what you write aloud to yourself to check the melody. Well, then there's plays, which are basically novels, but told only through conversation. A playwright includes minimal instructions for actions, but not for every small action the actors will perform. Things such as moves towards sofa and so on are for the director to come up with. If you're thinking of trying your hand at a play, a good starting point would be to educate yourself a little in the art of acting, so that you know what the people who deliver your work can and can't do with it. What next? There's radio, of course. Radio uses an enormous range of material, and the BBC Writing for Radio Handbook contains information about all of this. To begin with. I suggest regional stations for sending your stuff to. The competition for national radio is extremely high. Okay, another interesting area is children's literature. Now, very few, if any, children's books are published without pictures, but this doesn't mean that you, as writer, have to draw them. That's for the illustrator. What you do need to do is be clear who you want to write for. So fix on one age group, and then aim your stories at that. Right, I've saved what I consider to be the best and the hardest till last: the novel. Very long and very difficult to do well, but certainly not impossible, as any bookshop shelves will confirm. One of the first things to decide is from what point of view you will tell your story. A popular choice is the first person, and this technique certainly gives a sense of immediacy for the reader. While many new writers find it easier to project themselves into their main character if they can write in his or her name, but that assumes, of course, that the main character is somehow like the writer, which may or may not be the case. Meanwhile. If your book is all narrated by I, you can only put into your story things which are experienced by that character, which may prove to be rather restricting. Now there are all sorts of pitfalls for the novelist, and many of them relate to the issue of providing a balanced narrative. Every time you introduce a character into the story, you have decisions to make. Of course, you want to populate your landscape with a variety of people to maintain interest, but don't feel you have to decorate every one of them in elaborate detail. The same goes for irony. All too often, an inexperienced writer will create a strong ironic situation, and then spoil it by spelling out what they mean by it, as if readers were too stupid to understand. A few contrasting details should serve to make the point clear. A big challenge for new novelists is dialogue. What is the relationship between conversation as people really speak and as it is in novels? Well, it depends. If you recorded actual conversations and copied them straight into your narrative, readers would get confused and bored. All those unfinished sentences going nowhere. On the other hand, you don't want to write out page-long utterances by characters, as these will seem unrealistic to an extreme. But you can insert minor descriptions and actions to vary the pace and add interest.
Well, I hope what I'm saying is encouraging and not too off-putting about the various difficulties. Are there any questions at this point? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.